Chief Crazy Horse, pride of the Lakota people. Brilliant military tactician who handed the U.S. military its two greatest losses ever delivered at the hands of the Sioux Nation. Who was this fearless warrior and who were his people? Why did he fight? Why was the process of integration between white European settlers and American Indians so terribly complicated? Why am I saying American Indian instead of Native American? All of this and so much more in today's enlightening and entertaining episode of Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Welcome, Time Suckers. Happy Monday, and thank you uh, once again for tuning into the suck. So many entertainment options out there. So grateful you let this one into your life each week. I uh, love that you're loving the cult of the curious, and today's Time Suck is brought to you by the wonderful and enlightening show that also releases new episodes every Monday, The Partially Examined Life. That's right, The Partially Examined Life podcast is a philosophy podcast produced and hosted by some guys who were at one point set on doing philosophy for a living, but then thought better of it. And they made a good call. And I don't say that because there's very little money in philosophy. I say that because they're very good at what they do. Each episode, they pick some texts, focus on a philosophical theme, and chat about it with some balance between insight and flippancy. You don't have to know anything about philosophy or even to have read the text they're talking about to follow along. I can attest to that because I listen and I enjoy, and I know very little about philosophy, and I've read none of the texts they recommend uh, so far. I just, I've just been busy. They sound like good books. Uh, the Partially Examined Life grew out of an attempt to recreate good old grad school days, drinking beer and talking shop after a seminar. I love that, and I get it, man. Interactions with time suckers have replaced my old college conversations. You can imagine listening in on these conversations like you're, like you're at the bar, except now you can rewind. Or yell obscenities without starting a fight. New episodes come out each Monday, and for a very small monthly fee, you can access complete ad-free episodes and bonus content. So get the podcast on iTunes, The Partially Examined Life, or go to partiallyexaminedlife.com. Check it out. It's a really cool podcast uh, I enjoy. Uh, big thanks to uh, all you Spokane time suckers who came out this past weekend, making the shows the best ones I've, I've had in Spokane thus far. Man, so fun. So many suckers. I was really surprised. I, uh, I've i had uh, stand-up fans in Spokane for a while, but did not know that time suck had really grown in the Inland Empire. Very pleasantly surprised. Got to get a live time suck going in Spokane in 2018 for my North Idaho and Eastern Washington uh, suckers. It's going to be so much fun. I'll figure that out, and we'll make it happen. So hail Nimrod. Uh, I thought those shows would be my last Pacific Northwest shows this year, but a last-minute show came up. Uh, and I will be in Corvallis, Oregon this Friday at the LaSalle Stewart Center at the Oregon State University campus. Uh, two shows, 6.30 and 9 p.m., performed with two other comics I like very much, both as people and as comics. I've known both of them for, for several years. Uh, Jay more than Mike, but I've met Mike several times. He's a good dude. Mikey Winfield and Jay Larson. Uh, Jay from the Crab Feast podcast. So it's going to be a really fun show. Uh, ticket link for those shows provided in the episode description. And thanks again for all the reviews. Holy shit. Over 1,700 iTunes reviews now, which just uh, fucking blows my mind, which means these bonus episodes are going to keep rolling out. I love it. I love it. I love it. The next Friday bonus episode uh, is going to drop Friday, November 24th. It's going to be uh, Unit 731 if you want to go real dark. That's one option. Uh, Unit 731 was a covert biological and chemical warfare research and development unit of the Imperial Japanese Army that undertook lethal human experimentation, horrific, disturbing shit, uh, during the Second Sino-Japanese War, which went, uh, raged from 1937 to 1945, uh, you know, going into World War II, horrific Nazi-esque experiments on humans. So that's choice number one. Uh, choice number two, we can go historical. We can go way back. We can go uh, to some military conquest. We can go to Alexander the Great, the ancient Greek king uh, who went on an unprecedented campaign of military conquest. Thousands of years later, we're still talking about him. And, and then there's choice number three, which is uh, a, a topic a lot of time suckers have written in about, Nikola Tesla. All right, so if he's the inventor, uh, the alternating current motor, and so much more. And uh, he was brilliant, eccentric genius, uh, who I know very little about, but I do know whose, whose inventions enabled modern-day power and mass communication systems. He was a former employee and then became nemesis of Thomas Edison. And uh, yeah, just a brilliant, brilliant mind. And a lot of our modern technology, uh, he kicked off the, the initial research for and the initial inventions for. So what can we learn about him and ourselves? And that sucks. So those are the three options that are going to be posted uh, today on at Time Suck Podcast on Instagram. 
You can go there. You can comment with your choice. Voting will end Wednesday, so it's going to end pretty quick, November 15th at midnight Pacific time, so I can get uh, going on the research for that and, and, and get a decent episode in for November 24th. Thanks to all of uh, those of you, by the way, who have bought tickets to the Detroit show on February 16th, 2018 at the Magic Bag. Uh, we, we, we need about 75 more tickets sold in the next few weeks in order to be able to pull off a live podcast. So please keep pre-buying those tickets. If you got friends in the area, please let them know to buy some tickets. And if they're going to go, please buy them soon. Uh, so me and the guys from small town murder and crime and sports can add that live podcast so we can do stand up, uh, you know, uh, early in the evening and then a live podcast a little bit later on February 16th. Ticket info in the show description. End of 2017 shows coming up. Dr. Grins in Grand Rapids, Michigan, November 30th through December 2nd. St. Louis, Missouri, Funny Bone, uh, December 7th through the 10th. Appleton, Wisconsin, one night only, December 13th. Right, Remember that town from Houdini? Uh, Skyline Comedy Club. Comedy Club on State in Madison, Wisconsin, December 14th through 16th. Comedy Works in Denver, Colorado. I've heard it's one of the best clubs in the country, December 28th through New Year's Eve. And I still need to add 2018 dates to the calendar, which I will soon. Uh, a lot of good ones coming up. Very excited about the touring situation in the first half of next year, uh, first quarter, uh, at least. Uh, yeah. And uh, and now, enjoy Chief Crazy Horse, an episode uh, that the fantastic Lily Twins, Rebecca and Sarah, OG members of the Bojangles research team, research phenoms, uh, gave me a wealth of info to get started with. All right, we are going to talk about Chief Crazy Horse, uh, I promise. And I have energy, actually, today. It's the first suck I've done in a, while, uh, in a while and a full night's sleep. Doing it at home in the studio. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to say the other things. I'm getting a, uh, I'm getting a real studio going here, putting the lease, uh, getting the lease started this week. So excited to build that. Got to get all new equipment and make it a fun little clubhouse. And yeah, man, I'll have, I'll have more info in future episodes, but man, the, the suck is moving forward. Okay. But, crazy horse, goddammit. But first, we have to lay down some context. History just don't make no sense without no context. I saw someone post a comment a while ago about an episode saying something like, ugh, more tangents than ever in this episode. Yes, there are a lot of tangents in all these episodes, Negative Nancy, because I'm not throwing these episodes out there for people who are already experts in that particular topic. Nah, motherfucker, these episodes are for everyone else. Don't get me wrong. If you're an expert, I do hope you enjoy and listen. But do so understanding the rest of us time suckers might need to be brought up to speed on some shit you may already know. So cool your fucking jets, okay? Before we examine the life of Chief Crazy Horse and I start throwing around a lot of terms, let's examine an important point uh, regarding uh, one of these terms, some, some touchy nomenclature, specifically the Indian versus Native American, uh, Native, uh, Native American terminology debate. I will not be referring to Chief Crazy Horse or anyone else in this episode, at least not intentionally, as Native American. I'm going to instead use the term American Indian, and I'll explain why I've made that choice. It comes from a place of research and respect. Until recently, I thought Native American was the most respectful way, uh, hands down, to refer to someone who was, you know, well, uh, Native American, outside of referring to them as a member of their tribe, specific tribe. And for, for some American Indians, it still is, definitely, but not all. Thanks to an episode of A Partially Examined Life, the, the Partially Examined Life podcast, uh, part one of a two-parter, called Relating to American Indian Philosophy, where Brian Burkhart, an American Indian Studies professor at Cal State Northridge, is interviewed and listening to him speak, I learned it's a complicated issue. Brian states that a lot of scholars now hesitate using the term Native American and that the safer term is American Indian, the reason being that Native American can sound like someone is native to America, but in truth, many tribe members identify as being native to their nation, which existed before America, such as the Shawnee, Cherokee, Seneca, etc., they're native to that nation, not native to America. And that's an important distinction for many people. And I know that goes against what I was taught, that the term Indian was a, a derogatory. But man, language, man, language, semantics, so tricky. We're all these breathing sacks of meat with all these thoughts regarding what we feel is right and appropriate and important to us. We all have our own individual dreams, goals, needs, desires, feelings, and we're constantly trying to express them to all these other meat sacks walking amongst us who have their own thoughts and goals and everything else. And the message is rarely conveyed with 100% accuracy. Language has evolved to make it possible to convey everything as best we can, but it never quite sums up exactly what you're feeling. I mean, like, take the word love. Think about how often we say it. I love the Dodgers. I love my mom. I love my dad. I love this person I just started knocking it out with three weeks ago. I love Jesus. I love to play with my wiener in the shower. I love run the jewels. I love a woman with tattoos and heels with fishnet stockings. Exact same word, 
very different meanings when said in those very different ways. You know, you don't love a sports te- team the way you, you love someone sexually or love a family member or love a concept or love a religious person. You know, I love hope. I love hope. You've assigned different meanings to that one word, but you know, but uh, they're similar, but not exact. And the way you express love, if you're a very emotional person, is also not going to be the way you express love if you're a very like stoic person, for example. And that's going to be, you know, different than the way you express love if you're a mentally ill necrophiliac, you know, for one kind words, nurturing behavior, physical affection, uh, supportive gestures for another person, how they express love, sexual molestation of a rotting corpse for a third person. That's how they express love. Tomato, tomato, a penis in a rotting butthole. Anywho, I think it's a semantics issue is going on with the terms Native American and, and, and American Indian. Some American Indians do not like the word Native American for the reasons I described. Some don't like Indian because they feel it refers to uh, someone from India or because of historical derogatory usage. And, and they don't want American Indian because they identify with their tribe or nation more than the American nation. So basically, no matter what term you, term you use, there's a good chance you're going to offend someone. So all you can do is understand what each term means to various tribe members and make your own decision of which term to use in a public setting like this one. Uh, I think I get it as much as a white guy who doesn't have any real trigger words as far as uh, my identity go can get it. To understand it a little more, uh, get more than one professor's perspective on it, I did Google Native American or Indian and was led to an article on a website called Indian Country Medical, uh, Indian Country Media Network.com, written by author Amanda Blackhorse called Do You Prefer Native American? or American Indian, six prominent voices respond. Amanda, by the way, is a psychiatric social worker living in Phoenix who was raised in the Arizona portion of the Navajo Nation. The largest land area retained by Native American tribe in the United States, uh, covering portions of Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, total population of roughly 340,000. Black Horse was a leading plaintiff in a Supreme Court trial trying to get the Washington Redskins a while back to change their name, feeling, as many do, that the term Redskin was racist and is racist. Uh, the court decided in favor of the Redskins and the NFL, by the way. And this, uh, this claim is over. Amanda claims she was motivated to file this lawsuit when she went to a Chiefs versus Redskins game at Arrowhead Stadium in Kansas City, where she says that, go back to your reservation. We won. You lost. Get over it. Go get drunk. And so many different slurs were uttered. I've experienced racism in my lifetime, she said. But to see it outwardly and nobody did anything, it was shocking. Pretty fucked up if that's true, and I have no reason to believe Amanda has lied about that. Like, what kind of person yells shit like that at some poor woman? Uh, an ignorant asshole. That's who. An idiot of the internet. And we're gonna we're gonna see what some of them have to say real soon. We won. Get over it. What the fuck you? I I, I don't think any American Indian is claiming that the U.S. government didn't defeat them in, in battle. No mentally fit person is claiming that because that's it's just not true. It's just historically and obviously not true. The U.S. government and its military absolutely won. But what's wrong with still respecting your heritage? What's wrong with still, you know, keeping your culture alive? Why can't, instead of insisting that someone let go of their minority culture status and submit to the majority culture, you know, in totality, why can't you just let them dress and talk and identify how they'd prefer? You know, if we're going to ask American Indians to stop wearing traditional headdresses and clothes, stop speaking their languages, stop being proud of their heritage, okay, well, let's get rid of St. Patty's Day. Let's fucking get it out of here. No more parades. All right, go back to Ireland, you fucking ginger motherfuckers. This is America. You leprechauns, not part of Europe. No more Cinco de Mayo celebrations. Uh Uh-uh, nope. Put the quesadilla down, Paco. Pick up the goddamn hot dog. Take out the sombrero and put on this baseball hat. No more Black Pride. Uh -uh. Uh-uh, uh-uh. No more Oktoberfest bullshit, right? This isn't Africa. This isn't Germany. Everybody needs to get eat apple pie, watch baseball, and shut the fuck up. Get out of here. That's horrible. (laughs) By the way, as I'm saying that, I was thinking about... My tirade right there being taken, com- lifted completely out of context and just put out for people to listen to. Like, this, this is what Dan thinks <laughs> about the, the, every race in America. No, it's fucking it's ridiculous, though, to expect uh, someone to get rid of their culture. You know, when everybody else gets to celebrate theirs, it's fucking asinine. So, so why am I going again with American Indian? Well, because of Amanda's interviews. Uh, B- Bobby Wilson was one. Uh, he's a member of the Siston uh, Wapton Sioux Tribe, or Siston Wapton, excuse me, Sioux Tribe from the South, from South Dakota, and is most famous for being a member of the Five Piece Comedy Troupe, the Fourteen Ninety Ones, which you can find their stuff on the web. He appeared on the Daily Show with John Stewart a while back, and he says, "I say Indian a lot. I'm around many natives all the time, and using Indian seems to be universal, and others can identify with it." Bobby also said he understands the conflicting feelings Native people have with the terms Indian and Native American, but he states, "When I say Indian, it doesn't take anything away from me." Some people, uh, for some people, it may. I'm comfortable with myself and with it. 
He also stated he doesn't mind being referred to as American Indian and references the National Congress of American Indians and the like, whom also use that term. And then there's Douglas Miles. Douglas Miles is the owner at Apache Skateboards based in San Carlos uh, Apache Indian Reservation, or on it, and is San Carlos Apache and uh, Akimel Udom. Douglas is also an artist, designer, curator, muralist, public speaker, and he said, I refer to myself as American Indian. I also refer to myself as Native American. I'm comfortable with both of them. Doug uh, then goes on to say, what would be the better title is First Americans, because in reality, uh, we are the First Americans. So there you go. Uh, other interviews with uh, American Indians who did not like the term uh, uh, Indian. There was other interviews with American Indians who did not like the term Native American. Uh, but when referring to the collective body of the various tribes who inhabit it and still inhabit North America, you, you got to say something. got to have a word. got to have a term. And for me, that term is going to be American Indian. So there you go. Uh, and that's just me. But, but let's see what other people uh, prefer with some idiots of the Internet. If you think we've outgrown racism, you just haven't been to YouTube lately. Holy shit. So many dumb motherfucking mouth breathers we need to eradicate immediately if the world suddenly gets dangerously low on resources. You know, if one day we, we just don't have enough food for everyone and we, and we have to let a certain portion of the population starve, uh, we need to use YouTube, I think, to determine uh, who no longer gets to eat and live. You know, die trolls die. You space-wasting piles of worthless shit. I went to a well-produced and thoughtful YouTube video titled Should You Say Native American or American Indian? Posted in 2016, hosted by Laura Ling, uh, a video viewed over 100,000 times, and my blood pressure rose to a dangerous level almost immediately uh, the second I saw the comments below it. First comment listed. Posted by YouTube user Jake Anderson, and I apologize for the offensive language. It's not mine. Is, quote... Which is more correct, African-American or nigga? Fuck you, Jake. I hope immediately after posting that comment, your doctor called to let you know you had a cancerous tumor in your little dick. Why the fuck? It's so fucking stupid to do this. It's not funny. Uh, it's not cute. You know? It's just ignorant. It's really ignorant. You know? God, and if you do think that it still is really funny... Man, you gotta let the, you gotta let that you gotta evolve past that, man. You gotta evolve past. It. It's not funny. A couple comments down, another idiot reveals himself. User uh, Sarvish uh, Chik, uh, Chidokar uh, typing, "I am from India," and then all caps, "We are the Indians." Lowercase and and then back to all caps, "Fuck you." What? Why are you mad at American Indians for trying to decide which of two terms they never agreed to be called in the first place is the least offensive to them? Oh, yeah, I know why, Sarvich, because you're a fucking idiot. What are you talking <laughs> What are you talk? Talk about, like, misdirected anger. Uh, then there's user Franz uh, Hackfurt. Uh, he soon joins the idiocracy, stating, It doesn't matter at all. Anyone who complains about how we should call a group of people are idiot social justice warriors. Seriously? Just doesn't matter at all, man. Doesn't matter at all what a group is called. Any old term is okay. Is that is that true, Franz? All right. Well, in that case, from now, I think you and every member of your family should be called little boy rapers. How's that? It doesn't matter, man. It's just, it's just a term. What's the big deal? You're just you're a little boy raper. And that's just a fun term I came up with for you. You know, I think that's I think that's how you should be referred to. Hey, how's it going, you little boy raper? Hey, little little boy raper. Party of three. Your table is ready. Uh, what's wrong? Oh, what's oh, what's wrong? You don't like being called a little boy raper at the office? You don't think I should just throw a pedophile onto you? Uh, you find that offensive? Oh, so I guess words do matter. I guess they actually do matter. Terms are important because that's how we communicate, you ignorant piece of shit. Fuck you, Franz. I hope this episode gets back to you. Uh, I hope you find me a show. And I hope you take a swing at me so I can legally beat you into a bloody mess. I know that's too much. I just I get, I get fired up sometimes. But you know what? If I were to do that when I was done, I could say, what, what do you think of so social justice warriors now? You sad little troll of a man? Yeah. All right, I know, but I know that's too much. I shouldn't get, no reason to get violent there, but I am going to think about Fran's stupid face next time I'm at the gym. <sighs> Finally, uh, I, I did find something amidst a preposterous amount of lazy ignorance and aggressive anti-intellectualism that really made me uh, laugh, so that was nice. User S'mores posted, Indians and Native Americans are two different things. Thanks, Columbus, for causing all this fucking ruckus. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Columbus. Christopher, you potster and asshole. And also, sincerely, thank you, Christopher Columbus. Uh, despite how horrible you were in some respects, it wasn't for you. I might not be here today. And I'm sorry, American Indians, but I love it here, and I'm not leaving. Idiots of the Internet. 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 
All right, so now we're uh, away from those idiots. Now we have the nomenclature situation explained. I also need to make sure I refer to tribes in the present tense along with the past tense. Uh, Time sucker noticed I didn't do that in a previous episode, the Bermuda Triangle one, I believe, and, and referring to tribes with past tense verbiage uh, only kind of makes it seem like they're it makes it seem like they're no longer around and no longer dealing with shit, which is not cool. Uh, okay, so now Crazy Horse, Chief Crazy Horse was a war leader of the uh, Oglala Lakota in the mid to nineteenth century. Oglala uh, means to scatter one's own in the Lakota language, and is one and it's one of the seven sub tribes of the Lakota people who along with the Nakota and Dakota make up the Dakota Nation. And the Dakota Nation does fall under the Sioux Nation. So it's a big hierarchy. And uh, and before we get into Crazy Horse's life and his battle to defend his people and way of life, let's get into what way of his way of life was and who his people were. An- annoying, right? I mean, we've been talking for a while now. We're just about to learn about Crazy Horse specifically, and now we have to learn about his people. How, how dare we try to better understand the culture someone belongs to uh, in order to better understand their words and actions as an individual? Uh, the Lakota are one division of the Dakota Nation, also known as the Western Dakota or Teton Sioux. Uh, when the Dakota Nation is split into three main groups, the Lakota moved from the northern Minnesota to the plains of the Black Hills to the Platte River and westward into present-day Colorado, Wyoming, and Montana. Known as Great Buffalo Hunters of the West, the Lakota are the largest division of the Dakota Nation, Again, and again, a nation that falls under the largest Sioux Nation. The Lakota were the first of the Dakota to leave the forest. They headed out west, uh, lived a migratory life following the buffalo. They needed for food, clothing, and shelter. Even though they ranged far from their Minnesota homeland, they, they still brought back furs to trade in, into southern Minnesota each summer. Uh, the Lakota people did not plant crops. They gathered wild plants such as onions, potatoes, turnips, strawberries, gooseberries, grapes, plums, red pr- prickly pears. Uh, Lakota people would also trade with other tribes who did grow crops such as the uh, Pioliers. Uh, a tribe near present-day Winnipeg that specialized in sweet pea cultivation, and the Mazaquas, uh, a tribe near present-day Ames, Iowa, that grew corn and were the first to create corn mazes in celebration of completed harvests. Uh, there was also the Creamaweems, uh, located near present-day Tallywack, Illinois, that specialized in cream corn. And don't forget about the, I made up the last three tri- tribe of uh, They specialized in making shit up to irritate people listening to them uh, and keep people paying attention to details, and they, they were some real dicks. But seriously, uh, the Lakotas did trade with those who who, who did grow tr- crops. Uh, they did do that. Along with what they could find growing wild or acquire and trade, the Lakota diet consisted primarily of uh, Tatanka, which is the Lakota word for buffalo. Tatanka is, is also the WWE wrestling name for a dude named Christopher Chavez, who, uh, if he wrote his own Wikipedia page, seems to be pretty full of shit. Uh, a little side note here, a little tangent I know. <laughs> According to it, uh, he had an opportunity to play for the Miami Dolphins, uh, the Miami Dolphins in 1988, but it turned, he turned it down to work as a divisional manager at Bally's Health and Tennis Corporation. Also, apparently he could have easily been a professional bodybuilder after winning numerous amateur bodybuilding competitions, but decided not to pursue that. Uh, he, also, <laughs> he also has a Facebook page with almost 175,000 likes, 175,000 followers but I couldn't find a single recent post with more than 40 likes or two comments. And that's weird. It's almost like his number is made up. It's almost like it's the result of bots instead of actual humans. Dude, you really did wrestle in the WWE. You, you did that. You entertained millions for sure. Why isn't that enough? Why do people have to go, you know, just full Sir a lot? Just, you know, yeah, bro, Dolphins wanted me. You're going to put me on a starting squad and shit, you know? But I was like, nah, I'm not walking away from an assistant front desk manager job at Bally's. Uh-uh. Sure, I could have played on the O-line. Could have blocked for Marino. Probably won him a Super Bowl, you know? Probably could have won him two Super Bowls in one year. I was that good. Maybe three. But you know what? I was making like 15 mil. I was making $50 million a year, assistant managing the front desk. And I have full control over the supplement counter. I decide, you know, how much creatine we get. Sure, bro. I could have crushed Lee Haney in the 1986 Mr. Olympia competition. Fucking crushed Haney. But you know, I would have had to cut back my hours at Bally's. Could have, could have, could have dropped my shal- salary to like $30 million or $50 million, whatever is less than $15 million. I'm not good at math. I actually don't know anything about Chris. Just seems to be a lot of outrageous claims about this dude. And once again, I've gotten way off topic. I'm supposed to be talking about Crazy Horse or at least about Buffalo. Uh, the Lakota people utilize the entire Buffalo, a.k.a. bison carcass, for food, shelter, tools, and equipment. For you terminology nitpickers, bison is actually the correct term. The American bison is a type of buffalo native to North America. Uh, the existence of the Lakota people was dependent upon the health and stability of the massive herds of bison that roamed on the Great Plains. Other animals such as deer, elk, and antelope were hunted as well, but none were more important than the bison. Bison meat could be prepared in various ways. Feasting usually occurred following a successful hunt. Uh, 
fresh meat being generally preferred. However, most buffalo meat was prepared for later use. You know, you only eat so much. It's a big animal. Some was dried in the sun to make jerky. Sweet, sweet jerky. Sweet bison jerky. God, I love some good jerky. Uh, Down to Lakota were rocking teriyaki sauce to make some teriyaki jerky, but I bet it was still delicious. Uh, One way to preserve buffalo meat for future consumption was to make pemmican. To make pemmican, buffalo steaks were dried, laid on a large flat stone, and pounded with smaller stone. When the meat had the consistency of a powder... Some serious pounding you're doing if you fucking get buffalo meat into a powder. It was mixed uh, with melted fat or bone marrow and sometimes wild cherries. Eating some of that sweet cherry meat. That sounds actually delicious. Uh, The mixture was put into hide bags with melted fat poured on top to seal it. Uh, Bison, you know, prepared in this way, could keep for three to four years. Three to four years. That seems insane. Like four-year-old pemmican has to have, you know, more than a little tang in it. You know, biting into some four-year-old pemmican has got to got to water your eyes a little bit. I don't. I, you don't swallow four-year-old pemmican. Uh, you grimace that shit into your belly. Uh, bison stew was popular as well, and uh, that had to be eaten pretty fresh. Uh, four-year-old pemmican will put a frown on your mug. Four-year-old stew uh, will put you six feet in the ground. Uh, when they weren't hunting bison, the pre-Americanized Lakota lived in teepees with uh, various close family members. That had to have been terrible. Grandma gets too old to set up her own teepee, and now she's staying in yours. It's 10 below outside. You know, you're, you're a young brave trying to produce a son to carry on your warrior legacy. Y- you must have gotten pretty good at some ninja dicking, right? You got to sneak it into your wife because you're only five feet from Nana Snores Like Bull, who's laying next to Papa Sleeps with Eyes Open. No, thank you. Uh, teepees were necessary, though, for a nomadic culture like the Lakota. They could be taken down quickly and reassembled so that the tribe could follow the bison herd. Needed those bison for the teepee. Sometimes as many as 16 to 18 buffalo hides uh, were sewn together for use as a teepee covering. I'm thinking of using bison hide for my next time suck shirts. Uh, maybe maybe bison foreskin? At the very least, uh, bison ball sack. It's probably the softest. Uh, anyway, the number of hides used uh, was dependent upon the diameter of the shelter. The covering was held together by wooden pins. Beneath these pins was a small opening used to enter and exit the teepee. A smoke hole in the top of the teepee allowed fires to be built inside. A smoke flap could be opened and closed to control temperature, uh, keep out rain and snow, provide a comfortable living environment to those dwelling inside. Buffalo hides were also used to make clothing, moccasins, bags, carrying cases. Women generally uh, worked the hides, tanning them, removed the hair if necessary, transformed them into useful items. And you got to marry a lady with a, who's handy with a bison hide if you're living back then. Don't want to get stuck with some, some wife making you some, some bison capri pants. Well, all, 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 the, all the other Braves are rocking some of those cool full-length shit, you know, with some tassels on the side like, like, a, like the bosses they are. And you got your little, you got your little bison shorts. Uh, Lakota clothing wasn't just made of bison skin. They also made clothes out of deer and elk, you know. Getting some dope-ass elk shorts for the, for the summer months. Maybe a mule deer mini skirt for a little night out on the powwow. The women spent hours following the creation of an item of clothing decorated with beads, bones, or other natural objects of beauty. I'm in awe of cultures like this, you know? No industrialization, no specialized labor. Not, I mean, not really. Everyone had to be good at a variety of things for the tribe to survive. You know, women are making clothing, you know, getting gathering wild berries, nuts, roots, and vegetables, making soups, other various meals. Women are erecting the, the home itself, taking it down, putting it back up, building fires with no matches, no lighters. Men and women are also, you know, before Europeans showed up, cr- creating knives out of rock with no advanced tools of any kind. You know, creating some blade out of something like obsidian, some other stone, making it sharp enough to cut bison hide from flesh, cut the meat and cook it up, you know, use, using it to whittle down arrowheads also out of rock and obsidian and different materials, you know, uh, make carved bows and spears, you know, use part of the animal to make the, the, the bow string. They're creating arrowheads, spearheads. Yeah, man. Uh, creating them strong enough to take down a 2,000 pound bison bull. You don't get to be the guy who specializes in computer programming and outside of that, you know, who just doesn't know how to change the oil in his car or unplug a toilet pipe. Not, not back in those days. You can't be really good at the, you know, one thing that makes you enough money to pay everyone else to do everything else for you. You know, Chief Crazy Horses of Dakota didn't, you know, use any form of currency. They would trade goods uh, for other goods. So, you know, you're some, you're some dumb shit who can't hunt, tan hides, find berries, you know, speak with a great spirit or start a fire. Well, you have no value. Now there's never going to be someone named, uh, you know, Chief Sits with Dick in Hand. I always think about how lucky some of us are to be born in the correct era for our skills. Like, like take Bill Gates, one of the world's wealthiest men. 
also doesn't see very well without glasses, and he looks like he couldn't do a single push-up without considerable help. One of the wealthiest men in the entire world right now, but if he was born into a Lakota tribe, like 1730, uh, not even remotely considered for chief. He doesn't make brave, right? He's known as he who is blind and walks with noodle arms. Uh -uh. Uh-uh. Lakota were spiritual people, uh, and I'm going to break down their spirituality, but before I do, time for a word from today's Sweet Suck sponsor. Time Suck is brought to you today by Lisa Mattresses. Are you sleeping on one yet? I've been talking about them. I am, and I love it. It reminds me of like a memory foam mattress, but it doesn't trap heat uh, to an uncomfortable degree like memory foam uh, does, at least for me. Uh, So good and and socially aware. You know, what if you could go back and, you know, give back while you slept? You can. You can do that with Lisa. Driven by the mission to provide a better place to sleep for everybody, for every 10 mattresses Lisa sells, they donate another mattress to a shelter through their 110 program. That is awesome. Not to mention, Lisa also plants one tree for every mattress sold, donates 1% of each employee's time to volunteer for local causes. I mean, very, very socially conscious uh, mattress company. If Chief Crazy Horse could pick a mattress today, I have no doubt he would pick Lisa. Who knows, you know, where High Forehead would sleep, but Chief Crazy Horse would rock a Lisa. So comfortable. We're going to be talking about High Forehead. That's a real uh, uh, name. We're going to talk about him coming up. Lisa's uh, patented universal adaptive feel. Is designed for all types of sleepers, features three premium foam layers, and it's available online in the U.S., U.K., Canada, Germany, or at the Lisa Dream Gallery in New York City. The 100% American-made mattress ships compressed in a box to your door. It's like magic. You will be shocked at first, like, oh, oh no, that, that can't be it. That cannot be my mattress in, in that box. It, they have David Copperfielded it into a box, uh, s- some kind of spell, and it's it's amazing. <laughs> one of the one of the most fun parts is actually taking it out of the box and watching it expand. Uh, and yeah, uh, and I will say, when you take it out of the box, you will never get it back in that box. So be ready, be ready for that. Uh, so try Lisa mattress in your own home for a hundred nights, risk free, with free shipping, always, and get a hundred dollars off, a hundred bucks off, when you go to lisa.com slash time suck. That's L E E S A slash time suck that's l-e-e-s-a dot com slash time suck 100 bucks off now back to lakota spirituality for the traditional lakota religion wasn't a compartmentalized section of your life it was a part of your whole life and and i'm using past tense because the lakota people uh, before the white man showed up you know is not quite the same as a lakota of today you know they were completely immersed in the lakota uh you know culture previously now uh, best case is is a hybrid the days of following the bison herd on the Great Plains are gone forever, and so is the totality of the life that went with that. Lakota traditions and spirituality were fully integrated into every aspect of life. The center of life is Wakantanka or Tunkanshila, sometimes translated as grandfather, often as great spirit or great mystery, but better left uh, untranslated. Uh, and you know, if you rearrange the letters in great spirit, and then you take some letters out and you add some other letters, you do spell uh, Hail Nimrod. A coincidence? I don't think so. Uh, Nimrod is as he always was and always will be. And his eternal ball sack was just as alpha-e alpha e and omega-e back for the Lakota as it is for us time suckers today. Hail Nimrod. The great space chubacabra of time and mystery. Uh, Chanapuna Wakan, the sacred pipe and the subsequent smoke, uh, you know, carries messages from humans to Wakan Tonka. According to contemporary Lakota oral historical accounts and discussions with elders, they did not have a written language until Christian missionaries translated it into the written word in the 1840s. And here's a brief description of the seven sacred rites of the Lakota people that were handed down orally for centuries. Uh, the first of the seven sacred rites is to renew life. A sweat lodge is held in a dome-shaped structure made of willow saplings covered with hide or tarps that symbolize the shape of the universe and or the womb of a pregnant woman. Heated stones are placed in a central hole in the lodge and the water is poured over them by the, some, some uh, Intankan uh, leader to create steam. Uh, the purpose of the ceremony is to pray for one's and the tribe's health and well-being spiritually and physically. A yeah, nice little little uh, American Indian sauna action. Exfoliate the skin, sweat out impurities, get out of the great, you know, the brutal Great Plains winter for a day. Uh, the second rite is crying for a vision. The vision quest is undertaken by an individual with the help and guidance of a holy man. Uh, Crazy Horse was actually known for his vision quest. He 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 had a a lot of visions that were that meant you know a great deal to him. Where like he wouldn't be wounded in battle and he would uh, be able to uh, you know. Uh, 
you know, defeat larger forces and, you know, bring great victories to his people. And it just, it made him fearless when he was fighting and really actually truly gave him the confidence to, to do those things. Uh, well, on these, yeah, in these vision quests, a person elects to go on a quest to pray, communicate with the spirits, attempt to gain knowledge, strength, and understanding. The person pledges to stay on an isolated hill for one to four days with a blanket and a pipe, but without food or water. Upon returning, the vision may be discussed with the Wakasawakan, holy man. Often the meaning of the vision is not readily apparent, and the individual may be told to wait for knowledge and understanding. Yeah, 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 you're going to have some vision. You stay on a hill for four days with no food or water, you are going to see some shit, especially if you're smoking God knows what out of a pipe. Uh, going to have all kinds of visions to talk about. I feel like my visions would revolve uh, largely around food and water. Just, you know, I, I saw I saw a great uh, bison burger uh, in the sky coming coming down to me. And then the burger was was suddenly floating on a, on a canoe along, along a stream, just a, a pristine stream that turned into a waterfall full of the coldest, purest, just most refreshing, satisfying water anyone has ever drunk. And, and then it, it, it turned in, in, into a river that floated above me. And also in the water were, were, were many salmon, just so many, God, so many tasty salmon. And then the bison burger merged with the salmon into some kind of salmon bison burger hybrid thing. And I floated up and I climbed and I just climbed inside of it. It was just cooked perfectly. And I just, I crawled in, I ate my way into the middle of it and I was completely at peace. And what do you, what do you think it means? Uh, I think it means you're hungry and thirsty and high as shit. Okay. The third rite is the keeping of the spirit. A spirit keeping is a rite performed by a mourner for one year to grieve for a lost loved one. When a person dies, the spirit can linger around the family and community. According to a Lakota known as Black Elk, this rite purifies the souls of our dead and our love for one another is increased. Fourth rite is the sun dance. Sun dance is often considered the most important rite and it's held during the summer when the moon is full. In times past, a number of plains uh, bands of the Lakota would gather at a prearranged location for an annual meeting of the Oseti Sakawan. It was during this annual gathering that the sun dance ceremony was held. During that ceremony, dancers pledged to make offerings of their flesh so that much strength would be given to the nation and to fulfill personal vows. The choice to participate is solely that of each individual. It is usually the result of receiving a sacred dream or is undertaken to seek assistance in healing a sick loved one. The sacred tree that is placed at the center of the dance symbolizes Wakantanka, the center of the universe. A uh, flesh offering is made uh, by getting a piercing, which doesn't sound too bad, because at first I was like, flesh offering? Well, well, I just picture people just like filleting parts of their fucking arm or something onto the ground. I was like, Ugh. And, then, and then it's like piercing. I was like, oh, okay, piercing's not so bad. Yes, it is. Uh, when you read an account of what it means uh, from like a witness who watched it go down in the 1800s, check this out. Each young man presented himself to the medicine man who took between his thumb and forefinger a fold of the loose skin of the breast and then ran a very, very narrow bladed but sharp knife through the skin. A stronger skewer of bone about the size of a carpenter's pencil was inserted. This was tied to a long skin rope fastened as its other extremity to the top of the sun pole in the center of the arena. The whole object of the devotee is to break loose from these fetters. To liberate himself, he must tear the skewers through the skin. A horrible task that even... Those with the most uh, resolute, even the mes even the most resolute, may require many hours of torture. So it's you know it's old timey language a little bit there, but you see what I'm sa saying? They'd have to like put this fucking stick, like this pencil, basically thing, you know, but harder than a pencil, kind of uh, through their skin and their chest, so you know pierces you twice, and you know underneath your skin, and then that thing is tied to the center pole, and you're dancing around it, and you got to rip yourself loose. So you got to. You gotta rip that pencil through your chest skin. That sounds terrible. Turns out being a dancer requires a lot more than just moving your feet to the rhythm of some traditional drumming. You gotta gotta tear your skin. Kind of really takes the fun out of the dancing, doesn't it? I, th I thought the worst part of dancing was having people see you dance and make fun of how bad you are at it. Turns out uh, getting your skin ripped makes a, a little embarrassment not seem as bad in comparison. Uh, the fifth rite is making relatives. It establishes a relationship on earth, which is a reflection of that real relationship with Wakantanka. It was usually performed to unite a younger person with a family, and it can be a way of solidifying relationships with other individuals as well as Wakantanka. Uh, this ceremony represents the formal adoption of people as relatives. 
How cool is that, man? Relations weren't just established by blood and marriage for the Lakota. You could choose someone you just cared for a great deal, someone your family cared for, someone you're close to, and just incorporate them into your blood family with a ceremony. What a, what an honor, man. Picking your tribe. Ah, I feel like the, the, the time suck equivalent of this is going to be becoming a space lizard when that's all ready. Our own little clubhouse. People united by choice and curiosity, not by blood and happenstance. I'm rocking a serious joy, uh, joy boner right now. Thinking about that, just rock hard for family, which I know sounds bad. Again, taken out of context, you know, being rock hard for your, for your family. But I think you know what I mean. Talking about a non-sexual symbolic erection of friendship right now. I just, I do think that is so awesome, though. Okay, six right is the puberty ceremony. Uh, the ceremony takes place after a girl's first uh, menstruation. Prayers are said to ensure she will grow up to have all the virtues of a Lakota woman and understand the meaning of her new role and to formally announce her eligibility as a potential wife and mother. And again, I know, I know this can sound bad when we, whenever we talk about history and like, you know, girls, you know, being sexualized so early, but it's just kind of the way the world had to work. People didn't live that long in many cases. And, you know, yeah, you're 13, you're 14, you hit puberty. Yeah, you, you are a kid, but you also can birth a child and they needed kids back then. So that's when they... That's when they got womanized. Uh, in place of, uh, here's a seventh rite, which I guess used to be Tapa uh, Wanakipiapi, which was throwing a ball like a, like a game, which represents the course of a man's life. Uh, I guess that's no longer in use. There is the religious practice known as Yuwipi, which became popular in the 20th century. It encompasses a number of cultural concepts related to traditional life and problems confronting contemporary Lakota peoples. This rite is performed in a darkened room under the supervision of a Uwipi man or a Kasawakan. Uh, the object is to cure a person and at the same time pray for the general welfare of all Indian people and for long life for the kinship group. Some Uwipi men possess an exceptional ability that allows them to locate lost items or people during this uh, rite. So I don't know, man. It's getting fucking weird. I don't fully understand that one. Some kind of re remote viewing reference there. All right, a little, little mystical. That's okay, a little mysticism. Opening the third eye, seeing some shit. Sounds interesting. Okay, I like it. Uh, the Lakota had a rich culture, including their own distinct music, like other Dakota groups. You know, many Lakota bands would meet in the summer and engage in group activities. When I say bands, actually, in that context, though, after referencing music, I don't want to confuse you. Bands is like a, like a tribe. It's not like, it's not like uh, you know, they got the, the traveling, like in whatever, band meeting up. It's not, it's not like a music festival. Uh, different groups of Lakota would meet in the summer and engage in, you know, activities including political council meetings, religious ceremonies like the Sundance, sporting events, marriages, coming-of-age ceremonies. Summers were a special opportunity to see family members who were members now of other bands. You know, maybe maybe you're fucking Ants and Pearl Jam now, but you're in Soundgarden. And, uh, you know, you get to see somebody who's, you know, part of, you know, uh, the fucking Doobie Brothers. <laughs> oh, little Michael motherfucking McDonald. You get to see him in the summer. Anyway, reg regarding marriage, I couldn't find a specific breakdown of Lakota marriage concepts and traditions, but I did find a good information on Sioux customs. And as far as, again, broad strokes go, you know, the, the average Lakota life was very similar. Just, you know, they're part of the Sioux Nation. So this probably applied to the Lakota bands. Uh, Sioux girls usually married shortly after having their puberty rites held after, you know, they first started menstruating. Males were expected to participate in at least one or more successful war parties, though, or horse raids to prove their valor and courage before they were considered worthy of a wife. So the average Sioux groom was usually quite a bit older, sometimes by as much as 20 years or more. And again, I know that by today's standard, that can sound a little molestery, but it wasn't that way back then. It was pragmatic, you know? It was just a little pragmatism. And, and it's not like old dudes, you know, were running around skeeving on these young women. It's families would generally uh, arrange the marriages. And it wasn't always older men and young teen girls. Older women might also be acquired as wives when their spouse was killed in battle. Or died, you know, on a hunt, or just, you know, in general. Uh, the brother of the deceased was expected to marry his brother's widow. There was also a Lakota and Sioux version of divorce, and occasionally a divorced person would remarry, which was rare. Divorce was accepted, but divorced people were expected to remain single for the rest of their lives. And, and I guess those who did remarry were often ostracized from their band. Man, so you had to choose, you know, you know, stay in the tribe or you can choose love. Damn it. Guess I'd be living with Lindsay away from the rest of the band, and you know, away from the rest of my relatives foraging for myself to survive. Oh, well, at least we wouldn't have to worry about, you know, Nana snores like bull and Papa sleeps with eyes open, you know, cock blocking in our teepee anymore. Uh, polygamy was pretty common. Again, for pragmatic reasons, there was uh, more women than men due to casualties of war and hunting accidents. And so most Sioux men had two or more wives. And this is creepy. Often a man married one of his sisters or, or a couple of his sisters. 
Uh, it says his family tie helped to keep bickering and jealousy among the wives to a minimum. And it opened the door to some sweet sister dicking. Who's with me? Huh? No one? Okay, sure. I'm not even with me on that one. But, you know, I guess, uh, yeah, <laughs> when in Rome. Uh, a, a man could have as many as, uh, wives as he could afford to care for, and more wives meant less work for the women. God, man, in that culture, though, you have to feel bad about yourself if you're like a 30 or 40-year-old man living alone still. Right? That's got to be extra harsh if you're Lakota. You know, you got you got chief strong with bow and hard with cock. He's got seven ladies. And, you know, meanwhile, you know, weak with knife and strong with wrist is setting up his own teepee. Old old Andre Chikatilo, <laughs> he wouldn't have fared well with a Lakota. You know, just, w- why not give Chikatilo a woman? You get cut one time jerking soft penis under elk loincloth when one bison hunt on one time. One time, and chief never forget. Now I set up TP alone, without even one woman wife to wrestle and choke f- for coming. <laughs> if you're new to the if you're new to the podcast, uh, that is a reference to serial killer Andre Chikatilo. That is not me just making up a weird name and then talking about choking women for coming. He's he was a monster. He was a monster that appears here and there. And I could go on and on about Lakota life and tradition, but I think that's enough today to set up the context for Chief Crazy Horse. Finally, right? But we've already learned so much. Uh, he came from a rich and a, you know autonomous culture, and then prior to his birth, the European settlers come along. They want to change, assimilate, destroy his way of life, and he fights back. He fights back like a motherfucker, a brave leader and warrior whose life we are going to examine in the following Time Suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck timeline. Crazy Horse was born in 1840. Ish, okay. Uh, he was born a member of the Teton Sioux, aka the Lakota, a group based around the area of Rapid Creek, South Dakota, about forty miles northeast of Thunderhead Mountain. Rapid Creek uh, runs near present-day Rapid City, South Dakota, in the southwest portion of the state, not too far from the Badlands and Deadwood. His his band uh, roamed around the area of present-day Western South Dakota, Eastern Montana, Eastern Wyoming, and Western Nebraska. Crazy Horse was born to parents from two tribes of the Lakota division of the Sioux, his father being an Oglala and his mother being a Miniconjo. Uh, his father, born in 1810, was also named Crazy Horse. Crazy Horse was named uh, Chaoha in the wilderness or among the trees at birth, meaning he was one with nature. His mother, Rattling Blanket Woman, born roughly around 1814, gave him the nickname of Curly or Light Hair as his light curly hair resembled her own. He would inherit his father's name later when, he, when he'd have to earn it. Uh, the Lakota had come to the area in the 1770s, uh, the area I just described. White fur trappers had been living in this area in small numbers since the turn of the 18th century when France laid claim to the land. France would grant Spain the territory in 1762, and then in 1803, America would buy in the Louisiana Territory purchase from Napoleon. Napoleon, we gotta, we gotta suck him one of these days. Still, the area had almost no white settlers, just a cabin here and there, no communities. In 1817, an American fur trading post was set up at present-day Fort Pierre, and some settlers followed, followed but again, not a lot. Uh, during the 1830s, there was good money in fur trading, and more settlers made their journey west until the 1840s when the demand for fur diminished in Europe. Settlements slowed down and didn't pick up until the 1850s when Sioux Falls and Yankton were founded. Uh, gold would soon be discovered in the area, and a lot of people come in. In 1858, the Yankton Sioux tribe signed a treaty ceding most of eastern Dakota to the U.S., but Chief Crazy Horse's homeland to the west was still largely untouched. Uh, it wasn't until uh, 1861, 18 years after Crazy Horse's birth, that the Dakota Territory would, uh, was even founded at all by the U.S. government. South Dakota wasn't recognized as a state until November 2nd of 1889. Many years later, Montana became a state on November 8, 1889. Wyoming uh, was recognized on July 10, 1890. Uh, Nebraska uh, had become a state on March 1st, 1867. And by then, you know, Crazy Horse was, you know, 25 years old. I say all this to, uh, you know, uh, roughly, you know, 25, I guess, 25, 20, 27. There, there, is, there is some bouncing around his, about his birthdays. You know, he's 1840, 1843. In that range is when he was believed. It's not like they had birth certificates back then. Uh, I say all, all this to explain that, you know, although the United States was up and running when Crazy Horse was born, it hadn't overtaken his culture yet. It was brand new to his band of people in any real sense. His, his people knew of the Americans for sure. You know, a few homesteaders here and there. Uh, ancestors had run into them, you know, more south and east. 
uh, from where they currently live. Uh, some military officers and cal- uh, cavalry stationed uh, at a few sparse forts set up recently to protect homesteaders. They'd encountered them here and there. But when he was born, th- you know, they, they just weren't completely surrounded by the American culture yet. The Oregon Trail had just begun uh, to cut through their territory in the 1830s. It was all very new. So not much is known about the very early years of Crazy Horse's life, kind of like the 1840, 1848 kind of period. He would have grown up with the traditional ways of the Lakota. As a very young child, he would have learned things like recognizing animals, what types of plants were edible. He would have lain in the tall grass of the prairie, listening to and attuning his senses to nature, games like the hoop toss, whipping toss game, whirling bone game with his friends. He would have been taught the ways of his people from multiple sources, from his father, aunts, uncles, grandmothers, grandfathers, any member of the tribe. Learning happening, you know, just every day and was always something that prepared the young man for his future life as a warrior for the tribe. As a boy of four or five, he would have already mastered the use of tomahawks, bows, and would have uh, been good at horseback riding, which is insane to me. A tomahawk, isn't it? A tomahawk at five? That seems excessive. Like if I would have been given, if I would have given my daughter a tomahawk at five years old, at least one family member would have been tomahawked in their sleep by now. We'd be down at least one family member. You know, I, I shouldn't have been given a tomahawk myself at five. If I would have been, been given a tomahawk at five, uh, one of my hands would for sure have less than five fingers now. I picture a lot of young Lakota warriors, you know, having anywhere between six and nine fingers total. You know, uh, this is Clumsy Chopper. And this is his son, hands like crawdad. Uh, Crazy Horse would be called Curly until he earned his father's name, uh, Tsunka Witko, Crazy Horse, uh, by proving himself in battle. Contemporaries of Crazy Horse described him as fairer skinned than the typical American Indian of the time with lighter, wavy hair than most, as we said. Uh, they also described his character as introspective. Crazy Horse always thought, you know, took his time before speaking. And, uh, and all these jokes I've been making about the American Indian uh, names uh, made me think, like, how did they come up with these names? Like, what was that process? Well, according to a 2000, or, or is that process? I know, it actually, it does still go on. Uh, according to a 2005, or 2015, excuse me, article in the Lakota Country Times, in Lakota culture, names are given for a variety of reasons, including for accomplishments and other milestones. You know, names uh, are passed down through families, often have historical meanings attached to them. Many Lakota feel that the traditional name that is granted to a child is the name that is used in the next life as well. To arrive at the name, tribal elders host an actual naming ceremony where they give young tribe members their new names. In 2012, a Lakota tribe member, uh, Sid Bad Moccasin III, said the main reasons we as Lakota people have naming ceremonies is to instill our cherished identity as Lakota people into their hearts and minds with songs, prayers, guidance, and passing down thousands of years of wisdom on to the next generations. Our naming ceremonies are elaborate and can last up to two or four days uh, of, of speeches, Sweat Lodge, ceremonies, feasts, and giveaways. So it's a big transformation. I was honored to go through a Lakota naming ritual. Uh, a while back, I arranged it specifically for this episode, and I was given the name of Man Who Annoys with Vicious McDonalding. When halfway through the ceremony, I just started belting out. You Telling me things you gonna do for me What I think I see Taking it to the street 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 Oh, shit <laughs> That was especially vicious I found some karaoke background music And I, I couldn't help myself uh, Kidding, of course I, I was actually given the name of He who abruptly yells Bojangles One-eyed, three-legged pit bull warrior And spirit brother of Crazy Horse Again, kidding. Uh, no one has given me, or will probably ever give me, a naming ceremony since I'm not Native American. Uh, since I'm not American Indian. See, tricky with these the, the nomenclature. Anyway, apparently a lot of the real names given in naming ceremonies that appear to us speakers of English as a little less than flattering are are actually good names that have just lost their meaning in translation. Because I've always found like uh, uh, some of these names like weird. Like what? That doesn't seem like a cool name to have. But I but I guess it's a translation error most of the time. Uh, I found an explanation for this on an American Indian uh, message board. It says, some names have been misinterpreted over the years, such as a Lakota relative known as Man Afraid of His Horses. His name in Lakota, Tacoma uh, Kokopapi, was mistranslated by white interpreters in the 1800s and has been that way ever since. His name should have been more correctly translated as The Man of Whose Horse We Are Afraid, meaning that he was so fierce in battle that the mere sight of his horse inspired fear in his enemies. 
Another way of interpreting the implied meaning would be they are even afraid of his horse. Man, they are even afraid of his horse does paint a very different picture of a man than man afraid of horses. Man afraid of horses, uh, man, uh, that sounds like a dude who trembles a lot. You know, he's shifty eyed, he's jumpy, he's got a bad heart, uh, suffers from exercise induced asthma, he's skinny fat, mumbles when he speaks, you know. They are even afraid of his horses, on the other hand, has pecs that appear permanently flexed. Uh, He has a 16 pack on his stomach. Uh, He has enough bass in his voice to make toddlers fall down around him when he talks. Uh, He he doesn't hunt wolves. He he demands that they lay down and die, and they quickly oblige. Yeah, Chief Crazy Horse experienced tragedy at a young age. His, His mother died when he was only four years old. His father, her husband, had recently taken in new wives, and she was having a hard time conceiving a new child. She thought she had lost favor with her husband, and she hanged herself. Yeah, early touch with death and darkness for Crazy Horse. That had to have affected his development. Uh, August 19th, 1854, raised by his father and stepmothers, Crazy Horse was uh, faced with great tragedy, again at the a- uh, age of 14, when he witnessed an attack by Lieutenant J.L. Grattan uh, on a brule bl- Oglala encampment in present-day Wyoming, where his band lived at the time. The altercation seemed to have started as a misunderstanding, while Conquering Bear negotiated with Grattan over a lost ox from a passing homesteader. No one knows who first fired the shots, but this attack on the Lakota people provided the fuel needed to create a flame of war that would last for over 23 years. A Mormon settler claimed that some local Lakota, a brave named High Forehead, remember I mentioned him earlier, that's a tough name, had killed his ox, and that may or may not have been true. What is true is that Lieutenant Grattan took 27 infantrymen, non-commissioned officers, an interpreter, a field piece, a.k.a. small cannon, and a mountain howitzer, basically another small cannon, and the group of 31 headed to the Brule encampment to confront Chief Conquering Bear and his people and demand that High Forehead be handed over to him. And again, again, High Forehead has to be one of those lost in translation examples, right? I fuck, I hope so. That's a terrible name. How rough would that be to go through a naming ceremony with several other youth from your tribe and you make it to the presentation of names and they're all like, you know, some big chief voice, you know, says, you will be known as Flaming Arrow and you will be known as Terror Wolf. You're getting all excited. You're like, oh, shit, here it comes. Badass warrior name. I get to carry on, you know, throughout this life into the next. And the chief just keeps going, you know, and he's, you will be known as Thunder Spear. And you are now Shadow Hawk. And you're like, oh, shit, here it comes. Here it comes. Please, please give me something awesome like Bison Destroyer or Snake Eyes or Man Who the Devil Fears. And instead, the chief is like, and you will forever be known as High Forehead. Just, ah, oh, fuck. You know the women snickered when that name was uttered? You know old High Forehead had to have been teased mercilessly for, mercilessly for that one. You know, other young future braves named after great warriors before them, giving cool, cool new warrior names. And he's he's given the name of the thing that he's already embarrassed by, some high and most likely receding hairline. Just what a bummer. I wonder who else was in that dude's family. Just, I am High Forehead, and this is my brother, walks with difficulty. And this is my uncle, he who wets bison blankets. And this is my father, cries like little girl. We are a sad clan, much despised by our people. Anyway, uh, Chief Conquering Bear lived in a camp of roughly 80 teepees surrounded by numerous other Sioux camps, and it turns out the interpreter Grattan used, Auguste uh, Lucien, was an alcoholic, some alcoholic homesteader who hated Chief Conquering Bear and his people, claiming they had previously run off a herd of his horses. So, you know, may have not been totally accurately interpreting what he was hearing. Uh, witnesses to this incident would also later recount that he was hammered. He was just openly drunk. So Auguste would uh, talk to Chief Conquering Bear and Man Afraid of His Horse and Little Thunder and report back to Grattan. The Sioux would claim later that the men offered ponies as a repayment for the ox. Like, we'll give him, you know, five ponies to make up for the fucking ox if this fucking dude will calm down. You know, they claimed the ox, that the, the tribe claimed the ox that had been abandoned by the settler and wasn't even stolen. It was just, you know, left out in the open by itself. Who knows if it was or not? Uh, but even if it was stolen, they certainly didn't deserve uh, to be killed, you know, because a member of their band may have taken an ox. Lieutenant Grattan wanted Chief Conquering Bear to hand over High Forehead, and Chief Conquering Bear wouldn't do so. So Grattan readied his men for battle, forming a line of battle and placing his cannons in position near them. A brave named Spotted Tail encountered uh, by taking a rifle carrying war party into a uh, nearby brush and preparing to fight as well. You know, some had rifles, some had, you know, bows and arrows. Chief Conquering Bear did not want to fight knew the interpreter was not correctly conveying what he was trying to say, 
and he, and he tried to, you know, walk a little closer to somehow communicate with Groton himself. Like, his, instead of having the interpreter walk back and forth between him, he's like, I'm going to come over. I'm going to try and get my points across directly. Witnesses said that August, uh, Auguste was telling Grattan that the chief and his warriors uh, were telling him now that they were going to kill them all, and then all hell breaks loose. No one knows who fired the first shot, you know. No one knows if it was the, the Indians or the soldiers, but once the first shot was fired, a lot of firing opens up, and Chief Conquering Bear is the first to fall. Gets shot numerous times. But then a volley of arrows uh, drops the soldiers manning the howitzer in the field piece, Grattan himself is dropped by arrows, and the team of 31 is quick, quickly reduced to 18 men. And then Grattan's last 18 men, outnumbered heavily as they are, because there were bands of other, you know, uh, in the area, roughly 1,200 Braves, and all were near the action. Spotted Tail and his warriors charge on horseback. The the, the remaining 18 dudes, uh, they flee, and then they are captured and annihilated by the Lakota warriors in what would become known as the Grattan Massacre. Uh, this massacre is depicted in a 2005 TNT mini miniseries called Into the West. If you want to ever check it out, find some clips for it on YouTube. And the war between the Sioux, inclu inclu including the Lakota and the United States, was on. And Crazy Horse's people, who had very limited encounters with the United States, didn't know who they were up against or what to do next. A few years after the Grattan Massacre, by the time Crazy Horse was in his teens, he is now a full-fledged warrior. His bravery and prowess in battle, well known by the Lakota people. Uh, he rode into battle with a single hawk feather in his hair, a rock behind his ear, a lightning symbol on his face, the symbols and rituals that went into preparing for war, meant to allow the warrior to draw power and protect themselves from harm during battle. And during the late 1850s and early 1860s, uh, Crazy Horse's reputation as a warrior grew. He fought a lot. Uh, the Lakota told accounts of him in their oral histories. His first kill was a Shoshone raider uh, who was murdered, or, or who had murdered a Lakota woman washing buffalo meat along the Powder River. Crazy Horse fought in numerous battles between the Lakota and their traditional enemies, the Crow, Shoshone, Pawnee, Blackfeet, uh, Ar, uh, Arikara, and he was named Shirtwear, a.k.a. war leader of his tribe. Uh, another translation problem. I, I'm sure in his native tongue, the title of war leader was a lot cooler than the title of shirt wearer is in our in our language you know it just sounds kind of sounds kind of weird y you have fought bravely in battle crazy horse time and time again and for your bravery we are naming you shirt wearer he who wears shirts the wearer of shirts and such things enemies will tremble at your sight oh great spirit tell me that is not the shirt wearer the wearer of clothes coming towards us no, I'm sure it was, uh, again, a yeah, translation problem. Okay, July 1865, Crazy Horse battles U.S. Cavalry. He's part of a large war party that outnumbered, uh, you know, that numbered, excuse me, roughly 3,000 warriors, and they descended upon Platte Ridge. The bridge across the North Platte River near present-day Casper, Wyoming, was guarded by 120 soldiers. In an engagement near the bridge and another against a wagon train guarded by 28 soldiers a few miles away, uh, Chief Crazy Horse and, and the band with him killed 29 soldiers while suffering at least eight dead themselves. The attack was a retaliatory attack for, for the Sand Creek Massacre of November 29th, 1864, when a 765-man U.S. volunteer cavalry force attacked and destroyed a village of Cheyenne and Arapaho uh, in southeastern Colorado, killing around 150 uh, most of whom were women and children. The location of the massacre has since been designated the Sand Creek Massacre National Historic Site. The attack, uh, that attack, was led by Colonel John Chivington. Chivington and Colorado ter Territorial Governor John Evans had adopted a hard line against Indians whom white settlers had been accusing of stealing livestock. Now, this is a little quote from Chivington. He said, Damn any man who sympathizes with Indians. I have come to kill Indians and believe it is right and honorable to use any mean under God's heaven to kill Indians. Kill and scalp all, big and little. Nits make lice. What a fucking... That is... I love how he invokes God there. You know, that's what God wants. He wants me to scalp children. That's that's how I interpret the things going on in my head. Okay. So, you know, he wasn't a fan. Uh, here's some gruesome testimony from witnesses of the massacre. Uh, I will preface my reading of it by by noting that I do realize the term squaw, referring to an American Indian woman, uh, can be uh, interpreted as being very offensive. I say it only when quoting someone else. I saw the bodies of those lying there cut all to pieces, worse mutilated than any I ever saw before. The women cut all to pieces, with knives scalped, their brains knocked out, children two or three months old, all ages lying there from sucking infants up to warriors. By whom, by whom were they mutilated? By the United States troops. And that was from uh, John S. Smith. That was congressional testimony. 
uh, from 1865. Uh, another one is, I saw one squaw lying on the bank whose leg had been broken. A soldier came up to her with a drawn saber. She raised her arm to protect herself. He struck, breaking her arm. She rolled over and raised her other arm. He struck, breaking that, and then left her without killing her. I saw one squaw cut open with an unborn child laying by her side. Ugh. That's from Robert Bent out of the New York Tribune, 1879. I guess he was there as well. There was one little child, probably three years old, just big enough to walk through the sand. The Indians had gone ahead, and this little child was behind, following after them. The little fellow was perfectly naked, traveling in the sand. I saw one man get off his horse at a distance of about 75 yards and draw up his rifle and fire. He missed the child. Another man came up and said, Let me try the son of a bitch. I can hit him. He got down off his horse, kneeled down, and fired at the little child, but he missed him. A third man came up and made a similar remark and fired, and the little fellow dropped. That was from Major Anthony, New York Tribune, 1879. Holy shit, man. Some heartless stuff went on. War is hell. Uh, I feel like these witness statements are important to mention because growing up, I'd heard lots of stories, you know, about the savagery of American Indians, killing whole families, scalping men, you know, uh, scalping women. But I didn't hear these stories. I didn't hear the other side. Could American Indian warriors be savage and ruthless in battle? Yeah, fuck yeah. Did they kill women and children? Yep, sure did sometimes. Did they kill men trying to sur surrender? Uh-huh. But so did the United States. Horrific acts were committed on both sides. Now back to the Battle of Platte Bridge. On, on July 24th, 1865, the American Indian uh, Army camped on a small stream a few miles from Platte Bridge. Scouts uh, reconnoitered the area. And the next morning, the Indians advanced on foot toward the bridge behind the cover of hills and on foot, leading their horses to avoid throwing up a dust cloud. A group of 10 trusted warriors, including Crazy Horse, tried to induce soldiers from the stockade to cross the bridge and chase them to the hills where the Indians were, you know, other Indians were hiding. But excited young warriors appeared on the horizon, spoiled the ambush, frightened the soldiers away. Apparently, Crazy Horse, a sh you know, and a Cheyenne named Highback Wolf and a few other decoys were disgusted with the failure of their ambush, and they crossed the river and galloped through two groups of soldiers doing little damage, but sending the soldiers scurrying back to the stockade. So this is like a Wild West battle, man. People getting, you know, on horses, fleeing, shots being fired, other people chasing them, you know, firing arrows, firing uh, more rifles. Uh, just, you know, craziness. Crazy Horse and the, uh, and the other warriors defeated the soldiers stationed near the bridge, but because they weren't uh, ready for a prolonged siege, being hunter-gatherers, uh, they just weren't equipped to knock out a fort and then hold the ground and fortify it. They left the area, and then U.S. reinforcements, you know, quickly came back and recaptured the area. So uh, the warriors, you know, they, they did a lot of hit-and-run style fighting on U.S. encampments around this time, uh, attacking a fort here, uh, attacking a wagon, a wagon train there, doing what they could to kind of prevent the migration of U.S. forces and settlers into their homeland, and Crazy Horse was a big part of that. On December 21st, 1866... Crazy Horse and six other warriors, both Lakota and Cheyenne, decoyed Captain William Fetterman's 53 infantrymen and 27 cavalry troops uh, under Lieutenant Grummond into an ambush in what would become known as the Battle of the Hundred in the Hand, a.k.a. the Fetterman Massacre. Fetterman's forces had been sent out to Phil Kearney uh, to follow up from an earlier attack on a wood train. Crazy Horse lured Fetterman's infantry up a hill, uh, Grumman's cav cavalry followed the other six decoys along Pino Head Ridge and down towards Pino Creek, where several Cheyenne women taunted the soldiers. Meanwhile, Cheyenne leader Little Wolf and his warriors, who had been hiding on the opposite side of Pino Head Ridge, blocked them uh, the return route to the fort. The Lakota warriors swept over the hill and attacked the infantry. Additional Cheyenne and Lakota hiding in the, uh, in, in the buck brush along Pino Creek effectively surrounded the soldiers. Seeing that they were surrounded, Grumman headed his cavalry back to Fetterman, the combined warrior forces of nearly a thousand killed all the U.S. soldiers, uh, and it became known uh, again to the white population as the Fetterman Massacre. It was the Army's worst defeat on the Great Plains up to that time, and it was led by Crazy Horse, you know, who was a brilliant military tactician. He just happened to be on the wrong side of history. The Lakota and Cheyenne called it the Battle of the Hundred in the Hand, and I say wrong side just because his, you know, his cause was in inevitably just just doomed. He could win some bot battles, but not the war. On August 2nd, 1867, Crazy Horse participated in the Wagon Box Fight, also uh, also near Fort Phil Kearney. Uh, the Dakota forces, numbering between 1,000 and 2,000, attacked a woodcutting crew near the fort. Most of the soldiers fled to a circle of wagon boxes without wheels, using them for cover as they fired back at the Lakota. The Lakota took substantial losses as the soldiers were firing new breech loading rifles, and they could fire 10 times a minute compared to the, uzzle, the old muzzle-loading rate of about three times a minute. 
And the Lakota charged after the soldiers fired the first time, expecting the delay of the older muskets, you know, before being able to fire again. And then the soldiers, you know, would just fire again repeatedly and just kind of mow them down. The soldiers suffered only five killed and two wounded. Uh, the Lakota suffered between 50 and 120 uh, casualties. Many Lakota were buried in the hills surrounding Fort Kearney, uh, Fort Phil Kearney in Wyoming. Such a good example of one of the many reasons the Lakota, you know, battle efforts were just doomed from the start. They, they didn't have the equivalent military technology. Like, you, you can be a bad motherfucker on horseback with a bow and an arrow, even a rifle, but that, that doesn't mean shit when you're going up against artillery. You know, it reminds me of a scene in Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, man. <laughs> There's this scene where this swordsman confronts Indiana Jones in this, you know, kind of market square, this outdoor market square, pulls out this huge scimitar, starts waving the sword around, doing all these cool moves. Like, he's clearly very good with the sword. He would kick Indiana Jones' ass in a sword fight, no question. But then after watching him just kind of do his tricks for a second, Indy just casually takes out a pistol and just shoots him in the head, and the fight is over. You know, and the Lakota, you know, in addition to not having equivalent, you know, military weaponry, they also didn't have the necessary supply lines. You know, they, they could beat the cavalry in a battle, they could, you know, take over a fort for a second, but they couldn't hold it. You know, uh, the U.S. could. They could send, you know, more troops via some trains back to the area where they had been just defeated. You know, troops with superior military weaponry again, you know, they continue to fight. Troops could hang out in a fort for months and months at a time, you know, because they could, they could get the proper rations. And L L Lakota and other tribes just couldn't do that. You know, they'd take over a fort, but then they needed to, you know, take off and get some more food and stuff again. But despite this, the Lakota and others fought bravely on. They weren't going to give up their traditional way of life without a fight. They weren't going to stop following the path of the bison herds without that, you know, without a lot of battle. Um, and if you think, well, why couldn't the tribes just adapt? Why couldn't they peacefully move to reservations, continue their way of life there? Why couldn't they integrate into American culture, farm a homestead, work at a store, work at a mining claim, buy a little house, live the American life? Well, they had a, they had a hard time doing that because the American European way of life was, you know, like diametrically opposed to theirs. You know, it wasn't just that, like, American culture was foreign. It was opposite. You know, the, the two cultures just weren't compatible. Like, you know, homesteaders are heading out into Sioux territory and essentially purchasing large areas of land, land that the Sioux traditionally hunted and lived on, and land that they felt could not be owned in, in the European-American way. You know, tribes didn't have a developed system uh, or culture of private land ownership like the European settlers did. The U.S. would try and make treaties to buy land from tribes in exchange for, you know, piling them onto a reservation. But the tribes didn't feel like the land was theirs to sell. The land belonged to their community, but but not uh, in, a, in a way of crazy horse gets, you know, this thousand acres and then high forehead gets this, you know, half an acre or whatever. Uh, you know, a tribe would, would live within the boundaries of their overall territory. And, you know, migrate around it, you know, uh, with the with the seasons, but they didn't each own various plots of land. The American Indians lived in harmony with the land, which was emphasized by their religion and beliefs, which we talked about, you know, based on spiritual or religious ideas of the universe. And, uh, you know, all natural objects within the universe had souls and spirits. In the religion of the American, uh, uh, a lot of American Indian tribes is believed that the souls, uh, spirits exist not only in humans, but also in animals, plants, rocks, you know, etc., you know, you can't mine gold on some huge scale. The gold belongs to the earth. You take a little bit for traditional jewelry. You make some deals with the spirits, but you don't go fucking crazy. Uh, the accumulation of property was further discouraged by the tradition and custom in a lot of the tribes, uh, which was to destroy all the belongings of an owner at their death. You know, you don't become chief because you were the wealthiest tribe member or because your dad gave you a lot of money at birth and you got to go to the best school and make the most, you know, high-ranking social connections and spend the most money on a campaign. No, you became chief by proving you were strong, brave, and you were a great leader. And then, you know, your legacy in, the, in that sense died when you died. And it was up to your son to, to prove himself if he was going to become chief. It was common for Indian societies to have more than one leader, by the way, among uh, some tribes. There was a you know, a hunt leader, a war leader, a ceremonial leader, so on. There's, there could be numerous chiefs in a tribe. All of these leadership roles required different skill sets. There was no assumption that a single individual could fill all of these roles. Chief Crazy Horse was a war chief because, you know, he was like Chesty Puller in battle. He didn't flinch, didn't show fear, led his men like a boss. 1868, uh, the Treaty of Fort Laramie was signed, giving the Lakota and other Sioux and Arapaho tribes ownership of the Black Hills and further land and hunting rights in South Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana. What was known as the Powder River Country was to be henceforth closed to all whites who weren't government workers on government business. And this te temporarily ended Crazy Horse's fighting with the U.S. You know, government. 
But then gold was discovered in the Black Hills by some trespassing prospectors in 1874. And just six years after signing the treaty, the government uh, double-crossed the tribes when they realized they just, they just were unable to keep white settlers seeking gold out of that area. Uh, migrant workers seeking gold had crossed the reservation borders in violation of the treaty. Indians had attacked these gold prospectors, and the war was back on. And then the U.S. government seized the Black Hills land that it had just given them, you know, given to the tribes in 1877. And then, it, you know, and then it broke up the uh, Great Sioux Reservation into several reduced reservations, which, you know, further basically destroyed their kind of migratory way of life. Interesting side note, more than a century later, the Sioux Nation won a victory in court on, Ju on June 30th, 1980, in the United States versus the Sioux Nation of Indians. The United States Supreme Court ruled that the government had illegally taken this land. It upheld an award of $15.5 million for the market value of the land in 1877, along with uh, 103 years' worth of interest at 5% for an additional $105 million. The Lakota Sioux, however, have refused to accept payment and instead continued to demand the return of the territory from the United States. The money remains in a Bureau of Indian Affairs account accruing compound interest. As of August 24, 2011, the most recent info I could find at a quick glance, the Sioux interest on their money had compounded to over $1.3 billion. And, and as far as I know, they, they are still refusing to take it. But, uh, but back to 1876. On June 17, 1876, a few years into the Black Hills Double Cross situation, Crazy Horse led a combined group of approximately 1,500 Lakota and Cheyenne uh, in a surprise attack against Brigadier General George Crook's force of 1,000 cavalry and infantry and uh, an allied 300 Crow and Shoshone warriors in the Battle of the Rosebud. Now, the battle, although not so substantial in terms of human losses, uh, did delay Crooks joining the 7th Cavalry under George A. Custer and contributed to Custer's subsequent defeat at the Battle of Little Bighorn. Uh, General George Crook was in command of one of three columns of soldiers converging on the Bighorn country of southern Montana that June. A large band of Sioux and Cheyenne Indians under the direction of Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, and several other chiefs had congregated in the area in defiance of U.S. demands that the Indians confine themselves to a new reservation, you know, to new reservations. Uh, the Army viewed the Indians' refusal as an opportunity to dispatch a massive three-pronged attack and win a decisive victory over these, you know, quote-unquote hostile Indians. Uh, Crook's column, marching north from Fort Fetterman in Wyoming, uh, the Wyoming Territory, was to join with two others, General Gibbon's column coming east from Fort Ellis in Montana, or uh, the Montana Territory, and General Terry's force coming west from Fort Abram, or Abraham Lincoln in, Dakota, in the Dakota Territory. Terry's, for Terry's force included the soon-to-be-famous 7th Cavalry under the command of George Custer. The vast distances and lack of reliable communications made it difficult to coordinate, uh, but the three armies planned to converge on the valley of the Bighorn River and stage an assault on an enemy whose location and size were only kind of vaguely known. As Crook approached the Bighorn, his Indian scouts informed him that they had found signs of a major Sioux force that must still be nearby. Crook was convinced that the Sioux were encamped in a large village somewhere along Rosebud Creek just east of the Bighorn. Like most of his fellow officers, Crook believed that the Indians were more likely to flee than stand and fight, and he was determined to find the village and attack before the Sioux could escape into the wilderness. Uh, Crook's Indian allies, again, uh, you know, uh, roughly 300 Crow and Shoshone warriors, were less certain. They suspected the Sioux force was under the command of Crazy Horse, a war chief who absolutely was not going to run. Uh, Crazy Horse, they warned, was too shrewd to give Crook an opportunity to attack a stationary village. Crook soon learned that his allies were correct. Around 8 a.m., June 17, 1876, Crook halted his force of about 1,300 men in the bowl of a small valley along Rosebud Creek in order to allow the rear of the column to catch up. Crook's soldiers unsaddled and let their horses graze while they relaxed in the grass and enjoyed the cool mountain air. The American soldiers were out in the open, divided and unprepared. Suddenly, several Indian scouts rode into the camp at full gallop. Sioux, Sioux, they shouted. Many Sioux. Within minutes, a mass of Sioux warriors began to converge on the army. A force of at least 1,500 mounted Sioux warriors caught Crook's soldiers by surprise. Crazy Horse had kept an additional 2,500 warriors in reserve to finish the attack. Fortunately for Crook, one segment of his army was not caught unprepared. His 262 Crow and Shoshone allies had taken up advanced positions about 500 yards from the main body of soldiers. With astonishing courage, the Indian warriors boldly countercharged the much larger invading force. They managed to blunt the initial attack long enough for Crook to regroup his men and send soldiers forward to support his Indian allies. The fighting continued until noon. Uh, man, just hours of fighting. 
uh, when the Sioux, perhaps hoping to draw Crook's army into an ambush, retreated from the field. The combined force of 4,000 Sioux warriors had outnumbered Crook's divided and unprepared army by more than three to one. Had it not been Crook for Crook's uh, Indian allies, Americans today might well remember the Battle of the Rosebud as they do the subsequent battle of the Little Bighorn in terms of, you know, substantial losses. As it was, Crook's team was badly bloodied. Uh, 28 men were killed, 58 were seriously wounded, but it could have been much worse. Uh, Crook had no choice but to withdraw and regroup. Crazy Horse had lost only 13 men in all that fighting, and his warriors were emboldened by their successful attack on these American soldiers. Eight days later, they would join their tribesmen in the Battle of Little Bighorn. June 25th, 1876, the Battle of Little Bighorn, Custer's Last Stand. By late spring in 1876, more than 10,000 American Indians had gathered in a camp along the Little Bighorn River, which they called the Greasy Grass, in defiance of a U.S. War Department order to return to the reservations or risk being attacked. At midday on June 25th, Custer's 600 men entered the Little Bighorn Valley. Among the Native Americans, word quickly spread of the impending attack. The older Chief Sitting Bull rallied the warriors and saw to the safety of the women and children, while Crazy Horse set off with a large force to meet the attackers head on. Of course he did. Dude was fearless. He was tired of being fucked with by the Americans bouncing them from whatever reservation was most convenient at the time. You know, he's running into the battle in the days when you didn't even get to always shoot men from a distance, you know? He was, he was shooting on horseback, you know, by, you know, with his arrow or rifle or actually tomahawking a dude. Jesus, man, face-to-face fighting to the death. That is beyond intense. It's amazing that he was able to ride on a horse at all with a pair of nuts he must have had. Must have been huge. He must have had to drape one giant ball on one side of his horse and the other side on the other side of his horse. Just so much nuts. Despite Custer's desperate attempts to regroup his men, they were quickly overwhelmed. Custer and some 200 men in his battalion were attacked by as many as 3,000 American Indians led primarily by Chief Crazy Horse. Within an hour, you know, Custer and all his soldiers were dead. It was not the custom uh, of the American Indian tribes to take prisoners in battle. The Battle of the Little Bighorn, also called Custer's Last Stand, marked the most decisive Native American victory and the worst U.S. Army defeat in the Long Plains Indian War. Crazy Horse was heavily involved in the two greatest victories of the Sioux Nation, uh, the, the biggest victories they'd ever had at the expense of U.S. military, and that's why we still know his name today. Unfortunately for Crazy Horse, you know, the demise of Custer and his men outraged many white Americans and confirmed their image of the Indians as wild and bloodthirsty. So the U.S. government increased its efforts to subdue the tribes, and within five years, almost all of the Sioux and Cheyenne would be confined to reservations. January 8, 1877, Crazy Horse's warriors fought their last major battle at Wolf Mountain against the U.S. cavalry in the Montana Territory. His people struggled through the winter, weakened by hunger and the long cold. Crazy Horse decided to surrender with his band to protect them and went to Fort Robinson in Nebraska. May 5th, 1877, Crazy Horse and other northern Oglala leaders arrive at the Red Cloud Agency located near Fort Robinson, Nebraska, together with He Dog, Little Big Man, Iron Crow, and others. Notice high forehead was not in there. They met in a solemn ceremony with First Lieutenant William P. Clark as the first step in their formal surrender. For the next four months, Crazy Horse resided in his village near the Red Cloud Agency. The attention that Crazy Horse received from the Army drew the jealousy of Red Cloud and Spotted Tail, to Lakota who had long before come to the agencies and adopted the white ways. And then rumors of Crazy Horse's desire to slip away and return to the old ways of life started to spread. Uh, you know... In August 1877, offers at Camp Robinson received word that the uh, Nez Pierce uh, of Chief Joseph had broken out of their reservation in Idaho and were fleeing north through Montana towards Canada. When asked by Lieutenant Clark to join the army ag- against the Nez Pierce to help bring him down, Crazy Horse and the Minikonju leader touched the clouds, objected, saying they had promised to remain at peace when they surrendered. But with the growing trouble at the Red Cloud Agency, rumors you know, swirling about of you know, Crazy Horse maybe starting trouble, uh, General George Crook was ordered to stop at Fort Robinson. A council of the Oglala leadership was called, then canceled, when Crook was incorrectly informed that Crazy Horse had said during the previous evening that he intended to kill the general during the proceedings. Crook then ordered Crazy Horse's arrest and departed, leaving the post commander at Fort Robinson, Lieutenant Colonel Luther P. Bradley, to carry out this arrest order. Additional troops were brought in from Fort Laramie. On the morning of September 4th, 1877, two columns moved against Crazy Horse's village, only to find that it had scattered during the night. Uh, 
Crazy Horse had fled to the nearby Spotted Tail Agency with his wife, who had become ill with tuberculosis. After meeting with military officials at Camp Sheridan, the, eight, the adjacent military post to the, um, uh, to the Spotted Tail Agency, Crazy Horse agreed to return to Fort Robinson with Lieutenant Jesse M. Lee, the Indian agent at Spotted Tail. Well, now on September 5th, 1877, under a flag of truce, Crazy, Crazy Horse went to Fort Robinson. Negotiations with the U.S. military leaders you know, had broken down. Eyewitnesses blamed the breakdown in negotiations with another translator who had incorrectly translated what Crazy Horse had said. The fucking translators, man. So many problems with language. So, you know, and sometimes there isn't just an equivalent word in one language for another. Semantics are based in culture, and if one culture is vastly different than another, as in this case... The words don't equate because the concepts don't equate. Well, Crazy Horse is being escorted now towards a jail, but he hadn't realized because of the language barrier that he'd actually been arrested. He didn't realize he was being taken to be imprisoned. Once he did realize this, that the commanding officers were planning on, you know, putting him in a cell and locking him up, he struggled to get away. He drew his knife. Then a little big man, friend and fellow warrior of Crazy, you know, uh, of Crazy Horse, tries to restrain him. And then his crazy horse continues to try and free himself. An Indian infantry guard lunges in with a bayonet, stabs him in the back, mortally wounds the great warrior. Crazy horse dies shortly after the mortal wound is inflicted, gone to the place that awaits us all, dead at the age of 36-ish. And just like that, one of the greatest warriors in the history of the Lakota and the Sioux Nations is gone forever. And that takes us out of this Time Suck Timeline. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. So that is the life of Chief Crazy Horse. What a brave and brilliant man. Too bad his mission to preserve the life and customs of his people, to keep their ancestral homelands, was doomed long before he was born. Outside of being a god of war, he, he also seemed like just an interesting dude. Apparently Crazy Horse refused to have his picture or likeness taken. He lived under the assumption that by taking a picture, uh, you were taking a part of his soul. And that would shorten his life. And his popular response to photography requests was, would you imprison my shadow too? When he was once asked by a cavalryman after surrendering, where are your lands now? He replied, my lands are where my dead lie buried. Okay, man, just so different culturally. In a book titled Black Elk Speaks, uh, a description is given of Crazy Horse's overall demeanor saying, he was a queer man and would go about the village without noticing people or saying anything. Oh, and by the way, if anyone's hung up on the word queer, that means strange uh, in the time this book was written, not homosexual. Uh, in his, Yes, not a derogatory term there. In his own teepee, he would joke, and when he was on the warpath with a small party, he would joke to make his warriors feel good. But around the village, he hardly ever noticed anybody except little children. All the Lakotas liked to dance and sing, but he never joined to dance, and they say nobody ever heard him sing. But everybody liked him. And they would do anything he wanted or go anywhere he said. And, and, you know, and he was a spiritual man, as I said uh, before, known for intense and frequent visions. And now we're going to take one last look back at his life with some top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Chief Crazy Horse was a Lakota military leader who handed the U.S. Cavalry its two greatest Great Plains defeats. Number two, Crazy Horse became a chief and earned the name of his father by being an incredibly brave and brilliant military leader. Otherwise, he could have ended up with a name like, you know, High Forehead. Number three, Crazy Horse died due to a translation misunderstanding. He didn't realize at first he was being taken to be jailed. And a separate translation misunderstanding with Chief Conquering Bear kicked off the battles he would make a name for himself in. Miscommunications, the root of so many of our problems. Number four, the Sioux Nation that Crazy Horse battled on behalf of fought in the Battle of Little Bighorn because the U.S. government reneged on a treaty that had just given the Sioux the Black Hills for the exclusive for their exclusive use after the government couldn't keep white settlers out of the area due to a recent discovery of gold. Gold, another source of so many of our problems. Money. Number five. The Crazy Horse Memorial on Thunderhead Mountain in the Black Hills of South Dakota has been under construction since 1948. And when completed, will be the world's largest sculpture by far. Polish-American sculptor Korzak uh, Ziokowski worked on Mount Rushmore, worked on the project from 1948 until his death in 1982 at the age of 74. His wife, Ruth, continued to work on the project until her death in 2014. Lori uh, Bekvar, the president and chief operating officer of the Crazy Horse Memorial Foundation and two 
uh, of the Zelkowski daughters, uh, Jadwiga and Monique, now work on the massive project that is funded entirely through donations. The face of the sculpture is a towering 87 feet high. Uh, and that was dedicated in 1998. When completed, the sculpture itself will stand 641 feet long and 563 feet tall, making it the world's largest sculpture by a lot. Uh, for size comparison, the head of Crazy Horse alone is 27 feet taller than the six-story heads of Mount Rushmore. In fact, if you were to stack all the heads of Mount Rushmore on top of one another, the Tower of Presidential Noggins still wouldn't reach half the height of Crazy Horse's completed sculpture. The horse head alone could easily fit two of Lincoln's heads inside of it. So a giant project for a giant of a man. Go to crazyhorsememorial.org if you want to visit or attend a blasting party when more of the mountain is dynamited away to create more of the sculpture of Crazy Horse mounted atop his war steed. Time suck. Top five takeaways. All right, hope you enjoyed the first American Indian suck. Man, Lakota champion, Chief Crazy Horse. Stay tuned to the very end of this suck, uh, by the way, for a few minutes of an awesome track, uh, awesome musical track, sent in by an Australian band named The Goddess. Uh, they're great musicians and time suckers, so we get a little, uh, little music preview. Uh, just because you listen to Time Suck. Special thanks to Time Sucker Jeremiah Haxard uh, for suggesting today's topic. Sometimes it's it's just, uh, you know, one Time Sucker suggestion that powers through. Uh, I love knowing so much more about the culture of the Great Sioux Nation than I did last week. Thanks to Sydney Shive for managing the Time Suck emails and social media again. Uh, big thanks to Jesse Dobner for editing this episode. Hit him up at Jesse Dobner. It's uh, J E S S E D O B N E R at Outlook.com for any editing work you may need. He's fantastic. He caught so many grammatical uh, mistakes I was going to make in this episode. So many. Uh, excited for next Monday. Suck already. Uh, the Dyatlov Pass incident. Dyatlov. Uh, I want another weird one, man. I want another weird episode. What happened to the hikers in the northern Ural Mountains of Russia in 1959? If they just died of hypothermia in the unforgiving sub zero Russian winter, why was one of the dead hiker's bodies found missing its tongue and eyes? Why did one have a fractured skull? Why did one have brain damage with no injury to the skull? Why was access to the region, you know, that they died in closed for three years after the incident? Why do I want to investigate it? Is it because I've been watching season two of Stranger Things and this seems Stranger Things-ish? -y? Does Nimrod compel me towards sucking this topic? Is it the work of Lucifina, sweet, sultry Lucifina? Another mystery sucked this Monday. And then maybe a murderer after that. Probably. Can't stray too far from murder. I understand the bloodless, uh, bloodlust of the cult of the curious, and Lucifina assures me that you will be fed again soon. Uh, thanks for the continued PayPal donation. So generous. Thanks for choosing to link to Amazon from timesuckpodcast.com. You helped the show. Thanks for buying Timesuck hats, shirts, etc. I am getting more stuff, as I've been saying, going. It is being worked on. The app is being worked on. Getting a studio set up where eventually, uh, for, you know, Time Suckers in the Inland Northwest, I'll have, like, visiting hours. You can pop by. Fucking check out the clubhouse. Trying to speed up development on new merch as fast as humanly possible. And uh, yeah, one of these days, life will slow down enough for me to get back to those of you who have offered your services in a variety of ways. Sadly, I've just been so busy, I don't even have time to get back to people who are trying to make my life less busy. It's a sad truth. Uh, hope to get to that sooner than later. We'll get back eventually. Getting things organized, believe it or not. I know I'm always saying I'm behind, but... You know what? The the focus has to remain the episodes always. Got to get the suck put out or fucking Nimrod will abuse me. I'll I don't want to get put in the in the in the you know in his butthole. I don't want to get stuck in Nimrod's butthole. All right, let's catch up on the will of the suck with some time sucker updates. Updates. Get your time sucker updates. Okay, Chesty Puller updates first. And I, and I hope you veterans had a, had a good Veterans Day, by the way. Thank you again for your service. Turns out I do not know my military terms, uh, which makes sense since I did not serve in the military. Here are uh, some corrections. The first is from Sucker and Navy Corpsman uh, Corey Ashoad. Corey writes in with, Dear Master Esquire, Suck Lord of Nimrod. <laughs> Of Nimrod the Third, I love how creative you guys get with these fucking titles. First, as a Navy corpsman, I want to say in the Navy, E1 uh, are not privates. Seamen recruit, but your Veterans Day tribute was indeed a great tribute to Chesty as every Marine and Doc Navy corpsman idolized him for his accomplishments, just like General Mattis. Uh, just some info for the suck at the Battle of Chapultepec in honor of all the NCO lost. Once you become an, uh, an NCO, uh, you gain a blood strip on your pants. If you look at pictures of an E3 versus E4, you will see. Uh, 
Also, in the Battle of Belou, uh, Belou Wood, the French gave the regiments the highest honor the French for a year, uh, can give to any of those who have served in the in the unit, past or present, uh, who are authorized to wear it. He says, like me, uh, love the suck and keep on feeding the sucking. Thank you, Corey. E1, not private. Got it now, and, and I thank you for the clarification. Next update from Time Sucker and Marine Michael Romans says, Dan, Leatherneck Sucker. Great, <laughs> great podcast. And with this one, you won me over. But being a Marine, I need to correct you on some points. First, Chesty won five Navy crosses, not six, like you mentioned. Second, Belou, uh, Belou, ugh, Bello, Bello Wood. Oh, there he goes. He says Bello Wood is pronounced like Bello. And third, um, uh, Pelilu is pronounced like Pelilu. Pelilu. You know what's tough on those is, is I, I really do look up pronunciation videos uh, videos uh, for those, but sometimes like the only ones you can find that are halfway decent are in the native language. So you're kind of doing like the original French for that word, not the Americanized French that has since become colloquialized and, and accepted. And again, man, this if we learn nothing else <laughs> from this uh, episode today, man, just the problems with language. Okay, so yes, uh, Pelilu. And last but not least, you were correct. We are a department of the Navy, the men's department. Keep sucking the good suck, and I'm sure we can make Bojangles an honorary devil dog. I love it, Michael. Thank you, and sorry if I misspoke about Chessie's Navy crosses. I did know he won five, but it was presented with different verbiage uh, and different accounts of his valor and different sources. The sixth cross I was referring to was the Army Distinguished Service Cross that he also won. And the book I read referred to him as winning like one cross, but then getting stars added to the cross, which made me, you know, the math a little fuzzy for me. But yes, five Navy crosses. You are correct. And, and so many Marines did write in uh, with the men's department joke. Uh, even some Navy guys wrote in with that. All in good fun. And this in from another Marine, Time Sucker, and one of Dayton, Ohio's finest police officers, Nate Nolte. Uh, so I just got done listening to this week's suck on the almighty Chesty Puller. Overall, it was great. However, be ready. I imagine you will get no less than 25 messages of some type or another telling you that Marines are not soldiers. Marines are Marines. Army guys are soldiers. Marines are Marines. I had to talk Nick, my son, out of driving to the potato state and explaining that to you with his Marine-issued combat boots. Just kidding. Obviously, he would have taken a plane. Anyway, you might want to mention that in your next update so as not to be mobbed at your next event. I did get a kick out of the bit about squids going up against or going up to the Marines and trying to order them around, though. That was nice. Hail Nimrod, Nate. And I love Nate's uh, email signature quote. It says, violence isn't always the answer. In fact, it's rarely the answer. But when it is the answer, it's the only answer. Man, agreed. That's, I love that quote. Sometimes violence is the answer, man. It's a violent world. And yes, I did get a lot of emails. No, no offense in t- intended, Marines. A Marine is a Marine is a Marine. And thank you again for all the info and clarification. Uh, we're all learning together, man. Trying to understand this crazy world around us as best we can before we head off to the next great adventure, wherever that may be. Final update, sweet one from a very dedicated sucker I have met several times, Shannon Frisbee. Shannon wrote in saying, hey, it was great seeing you in Dayton. I hope you had a fun visit to Ohio. I have a question for you. Not sure if it is something you can do. Well, I can, Shannon. Joe has a birthday on November 18th. He never asked for anything in all the eight years that we've been together. I was wondering if maybe you can help me give him a little surprise by giving him a little shout out on Time Suck. I know you record earlier, so I don't know if it's too late or even if it's something you want to do, which is totally fine. It was just a thought, but a shout out from you would totally blow him away. Either way, it's fine. We are still fans for life. He does so much for our family and is just sweet and loving. Just one example, he took me horseback riding through a safari for my birthday, and he's allergic to pretty much anything with fur and anything green. Oh, and he only ridden a horse once before. I just wanted to know how much I love and appreciate him. Anyway, sorry to send a long message. I know you are super busy with the suck. If you can, that is great, and if you can, it's fine too. We will still be listening and come see you every time you are close to Ohio. So until we see you again, keep on sucking. Absolutely, Shannon. Joe, happy fucking birthday, you magnificent bastard. I've met Joe and Shannon numerous times, and they're wonderful people. Man, it's funny. The past six months, as the suck has grown, and more and more of you have come out to shows, I get the same feedback from the clubs every single week. From the wait staff, from the management, they just say, your crowds are great. Man, your your fans are awesome. So well-behaved. Good tippers. Good people. That shit almost makes me tear up, man. You know, it's like I feel like a proud fucking parent when I hear stuff like that. I'm honored. Not only so many people have chosen to let me be a part of their lives, but but even more importantly, good people have chosen that. You know, wonderful human beings. 
You guys are softening me up, man. My, my Grinch heart is growing. You might just ruin me, but I love it. You make me a better person by knowing I need to be at the top of my game to continue to be worthy of a wonderful group of people's time. And that is all for today's updates. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. And that is all for today's show, man. Have a wonderful week. Buy those Detroit tickets. You know, if you're going to go, get them soon. So Jimmy and James and I, you know, Jimmy and James from Small Town Murder, Crime and Sports, can get more live podcasts going out there. Take a moment to reflect on the beautiful and rich cultures of the tribes that have lived in our beautiful land long before the rest of us did. Keep on sucking and enjoy a little portion of a song called Haunt, sent in by a great Australian band from Melbourne called The Goddess, the band of Aussie time sucker Shane Perry.